Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's JPA video conference on synchronicity. Uh, I'm Donald Grayson, president currently of the JPA, and I'll be your host for today as we address the phenomenon of meaningful coincidence from the point of view of theoretical physics and depth psychology. Uh, brief announcement, for those of you who are interested in receiving uh, continuing education credits for today's seminar, uh, instructions are on the Eventbrite page for the conference, and you can also email Ildikovoros at I-V-O-R-O-S at nyyung.org. Today's program will feature four presenters, Harold Atmansbacher and Beverly Zabriskie, who are here with me at the NYC Seminar and Conference Center, Morgan Stebbins, who's coming to us from Garrison, New York, and Dean Rickles, who will be participating from Sydney, Australia. Uh, Harold and Dean will present first this morning, uh, emphasizing the more scientific dimension of the discussion. And uh, Morgan and Beverly will uh, address the more psychological aspects uh, this afternoon, or uh, in Dean's case, uh, at different times. <laughs> after presentations, I will host, uh, after each presentation, and then at the end of the day, uh, I will uh, continue to host. Uh, we'll have Q&A time after the presenters individually, and then we'll have a panel at the end of the day. Uh, when we do Q&A, uh, you'll have to uh, go to the chat section on your uh, Zoom uh, uh, window and type in your questions so that I can read them to the presenters. <clears throat> we'll start off uh, with Dr. Harold Atmansbacher, who received his PhD in physics in Germany in 1985, went on to the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, directed the Freiburg Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology until 2013. He was later elected Associated Fellow at the College Helveticum and is president of the Society for Mind Matter Research and editor of its journal, Mind and Matter. His relevant publications include Recasting Reality with Hans Primas and The Pauli Jung Conjecture with Christopher Fuchs. Among other things, Harold will focus today on an approach to the nature of reality known as dual aspect monism. With that, I give you Harold Atmansbacher. Thank you very much, Donald. So this is, someone should actually, I'm just trying to get this on a shared screen. No, it's not working. We need this. We need the slides on a shared screen. And let's see. Um, Miguel, we need to share Harold's screen. Yes, but at the bottom, at the bottom, there is no share button. Is it that? So like over here. Uh, yeah, and then, okay, you want to share the yeah. application. So are you ready exactly. to share? Yes. That's okay. I didn't know how to get there. And you have to select the application before you press control. So we'll not do it. Is that okay now? Can everybody see yeah. what's on the screen? Yes, mm -hmm. I think so. So this talk is about exceptional experiences in the Pauli Jung conjecture. Um, and I, in the first part of this presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about what the specialties of the Pauli Jung conjecture are in comparison with various other traditional approaches to the problem of how the mental and the physical are related. 
So <clears throat> in the second section, then I will apply this framework, which is essentially a metaphysical framework uh, to something that we call exceptional experiences. And that of course addresses what Donald already said, uh, that addresses also synchronistic events. Now, <clears throat> the classic positions when it comes to the discussion of relations between the mental and the physical are all based on a direct relation between the physical or the material, as you can see here, and the mental. <clears throat> and then the question, the, the question is, the question that decides between these classic positions is just how the arrows between the material and the mental are fleshed out. There's one um, historically most influential version of this, of, of these kinds of direct relations, which is due to René Descartes 400 years ago. Uh, and Descartes posed a kind of interactive dualism between the mental and the material, both conceived as the stuff of which the world is made. So these are ontologically existing domains of reality, at least in, in the, on Descartes' view. And then of course the question is how they interact, how, that, how the interaction can be described. And actually it turned out over the centuries that this is a major problem in the Cartesian view because nobody really could flesh out these interactions. Even not uh, Karl Popper or John Eccles or Ben Libet or Henry Stapp in Berkeley. Now, <clears throat> there were two main reactions to Descartes' dualism. And you can already think yourself how these reactions would look like. Essentially, both reactions are more or less taking ontological substance from one of the two domains, away from one of the two domains, the material or the mental. The idealists, and actually this is a development which goes back much longer than Descartes to Plato, Glenn Leibniz and Berkeley were representatives of an idealistic position. Uh, some people say that um, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel were also idealists. This is disputed here and there. Uh, but the idealists would say there is no material actually. The only real substance is the mental, it's mind. And then, of course, the question is when it comes to fleshing out the arrows, the question is how can we derive the physical and the material from the mental? Also no sufficient, no, no satisfactory answer up to now. And of course the third, the, the second reaction to dualism was physicalism or, or materialism. Also there is a long history going back long before um, Descartes to the, to the pre-Socratics, Democritus, Lemaitre. Then we have uh, famously um, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And in current discussion, we have the so-called physicalists uh, Daniel Dennett, Paul Churchland, and one can probably say most practicing neuroscientists today are physicalists. The physicalist would say the mental does not really exist. It's just an illusion or it's epiphenomenal. What really exists is the brain and the body period. And then of course, the question is just the, it's just the reverse question that the idealist have, has to answer. How does the mind, how does the mental uh, arise out of the physical? How does consciousness arise out of the brain? No satisfactory answer so far. So <clears throat> um, there is a more or less alternative position to all these you know, classic positions that was actually first laid out by an eminent philosopher also in the late 17th century and at the early uh, no, not the late seventh. Yeah, the late seventh century. That was um, the Dutch philosopher Spinoza, and Spinoza came up with the idea that it's not just the relation between the physical and the mental that we have to discuss. There is also something that is neither mental nor physical, a kind of psychophysically neutral substance, which is the actual substance of reality, and the mental and the material are only two aspects of it. And then of course, the question is how to flesh out the arrows that you see on this slide, right? The, how, how, how does the material 
emerge from the psychophysically neutral and how does the mental emerge from the psychophysically neutral? Or can they both redu be reduced to the psychophysically neutral or not? All these questions come out of this indirect relation between the material and the mental. And you see here a number of eminent names of um, representatives of this kind of dual aspect thinking, the material and the mental as dual aspects of one underlying substance that is neither mental nor material. I, you, you see the list yourself, I don't have to read it. Um, <clears throat> then there were some philosophically inclined or ins philosophically inspired physicists who looked into this. You see the list too, and the, the, the one name in this list, which is highlighted blue, is Wolfgang Pauli, one of the two um, protagonists of this talk together with you. And you see here, there were some um, philosophically inspired psychologists as well, who looked at, into dual aspect thinking. And here you see Jung on the list and Pauli and Jung together in their uh, long lasting correspondence and in their dialogue and their conversations, essentially between 1932 and 1958, which is, let's see, 26 years, if I did that right? 26 <laughs> years, yes. So that was a long time. So they had really much time to discuss this but they rarely published about it. Everything you can, you can find uh, about the Pauli Jung interaction is essentially in their, in their um, written correspondence. And then after Pauli and Jung uh, deceased, uh, there was much work done by Hans Primas, by um, Max Fellmans, by, by the Finnish, philosopher, Finnish physicist, Kalevo Laurikainen, and many other people, including myself, and we, Try to develop this, uh, these ideas by Pauli and Jung forward into contemporary science and research, I should say. So um, while the, the program of naturalization, as it is called, in the classic positions is typically framed as the way in which the mental can be reduced to the physical or the physical can be reduced to the mental, in this non-classical approach, dual aspect thinking, naturalization is conceived differently. Namely, naturalization has to do with the way in which the physical and the mental, both of them, are related to the psychophysically neutral, either reduced to it or emergent from it. And we will see how this can look in more detail. Now, there are two, two different modes of dual aspect thinking. Um, one of them is called compositional and the other one is called decompositional. You see, it's one is just the opposite of the other. The compositional mode is, uh, is conceived in the following way. You have the psychophysically neutral domain and this psychophysically neutral domain consists of elements that can be configured in certain ways. So they can be composed in certain ways and depending on which configuration you choose, the configura configuration has mental or physical properties. And of course, in this uh, uh, approach, the mental and the physical are, are, can be reduced to the psychophysically neutral. It can be, they, both, they can both be reduced to the neutral elements of which the, of which the psychophysically neutral consists. This is inspired by a kind of classical system theory where you have little parts which you can combine and then you get holes and the holes have properties that the parts do not have. Uh, the major um, proponents of this, what's, what's today called neutral, mo neutral monism are Ernst Mach, William James and Bertrand Russell. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. And a neo russellian version of this approach is due to Dave Chalmers has become very well known. Uh, and you can find it in chapter eight of his book, The Conscious Mind, 1996. So this is the compositional mode. And here is the decompositional mode. In the decompositional mode, the psychophysically neutral does not consist of elements, but it's conceived as one whole, one whole, and of course, when you have a hole, you, you, you can't compose it. It's just the hole already. 
So what you can do is you can decompose it. You can um, partition it. And um, the partition that is important for us here in this context is the one which leads us into the mental here and the physical there. So it's a bipartition into two parts. And of course, this is not, this is not a reductive model because um, if you have parts and want to relate them to a whole, this, this is not what reduction, what, what's called reduction. Uh, it's, it's rather a kind of mariological move. And it's not inspired by classical system theory, but <clears throat> it is inspired by an essential idea in quantum mechanics, quantum holism. And uh, the key word here is entanglement. I will come back to that. The names that you see uh, listed here in brackets are of course, Pauli and Jung, but there are also other uh, eminent physicists who thought about this kind of dual aspect thinking uh, in detail and in depth. Uh, you see here Arthur Eddington followed by John Wheeler. And you see David Bohm who worked this out together with Basil Hailey. Um, Basil Hailey is the only one of those six people who is still alive and keeps working on this. And I should mention at this point that that uh, an extensive investigation of these three lineages, Pauli Jung, Eddington Wheeler, and Bohm Heidi, uh, Dean Rickles, who is uh, with us today, and myself put together in a recent book, which has the title, uh, what's the title? Dual Aspect Monism and the Deep Structure of Meaning. Now, meaning, as you all know, in this, in this audience, is something that's also very important for the uh, work of Jung and for the uh, understanding of synchronicity. And I will come back to that, of course. And I will present the um, cover page of the book at the end of the talk again, so then you can see. It's a Routledge book appeared just a few weeks ago. Okay, this is, a, um, artist, this is an artistic illustration of the Jung Pauli dialogue or the Jung Pauli um, conjecture, which has a lot of symbolism. You see the three, the, the triangle, which is the which, which symbolizes Trinity. You see the rectangle, which symbolizes paternity. Then you see the concrete and the transcendent. And you know, in the red triangle, they look toward each other. In the, in the blue background, they <laughs> look apart from each other. So there's a lot of symbolism, uh, which Jürgen Jaumann, the artist, put into this picture very nice, I think. So um, this slide shows you a kind of schematic um, illustration of what dual aspect um, monism in the spirit of Paul Jung, uh, of how, how this was conceived. On the left-hand side, you have the mental domain with conscious thoughts, feelings, motivations, whatever you can consciously access. And on the right-hand side, you have the material domain, the physical domain, if you want. Uh, where you have observed objects like whatever you want, particles, um, waves, uh, any kind of machinery. Now, if this were all, we would be back to Descartes dualism, but this is not all because we have a horizontal line here below which, uh, the, the, below which we see the domain where everything actually goes on that gives rise to the mental and the material and their separation. So below this horizontal line, you see this. So the covering term of this would be the psychophysically neutral. So this is a domain which is neither mental nor material. I should make a, a, a brief comment here. Neither mental nor material is not the same as both mental and material. There's a big distinction between these. So for instance, you may have heard about panpsychism which is also a position that uh, describes the mental and the physical and their relation. In panpsychism, there is no psychophysically neutral domain. In panpsychism, uh, there is one reality which is both mental and material at the same time. So that's really different from dual aspect thinking. Just to make that clear, maybe this comes up in, in the discussion again. Now the psychophysically neutral domain, which is characteristic of the dual aspect approach, has um, fr from, the, from the mental side, has the notion of the collective unconscious. Um, these are essentially 
uh, the archetypes in Jungian terminology, and the archetypes are indeed to be understood as neither mental nor physical, but preceding that distinction. And from the physical side, you come into the psychophysical and neutral through what physicists call the holistic nature of quantum reality. So quantum reality at its base is not consisting of local objects, which you can observe, but there is something much more involved uh, below that level. And that's what physicists call uh, quantum holism or quantum entanglement. And I, as I said, I will come back to that. So the archetypes are um, psychophysically neutral, but of course they can be distinguished um, in, in a certain way. And you can, you're all, this is the Jungian audience, you all know how the action of different archetypes into the mental and the material uh, can be investigated. And you all know that there is not only one archetype and so that all archetypes would be indistinguishable. They can be distinguished. And at the lowest level, at the most fundamental level of the archetypes, uh, Jung posed the notion of the unus mundus, the one world. And that level would be really the one in which no distinction is there at all. So this is a completely distinction-free domain, uh, which, which means that between the two aspects, the matter and the material, and the unus mundus, there is a whole hierarchy of different archetypes. And if you read Jung's works, you, you know that um, uh, in his later life, Jung thought that at the most basic level, levels um, close to the unus mundus, we have the archetype of number. And at the highest levels uh, within the psychophysical or neutral, you have archetypal activity like the shadow, the anima, the animals, and things like that. There's a lot bit in between. Now, let me show you one quote which is from Pauli in a letter to Jung. You find that quote actually as a footnote in Jung's publication on the nature of the psyche. Uh, this publication has an appendix, a kind of, is it an afterword or something? And one of the footnotes in this afterword uh, <clears throat> just gives you this quotation. So this is what Pauli says. On the one hand, the unconscious can only be made accessible in an indirect way by its ordering influence on conscious contents. On the other hand, now this is important, on the other hand, every observation of the unconscious, that is every attempt to make unconscious contents conscious has a prima facie, prima facie, English, I don't know, it's Latin, uncontrollable reaction back onto these unconscious contents themselves, as is well known, this precludes that the unconscious can be exhaustively brought to consciousness. There's always something that remains unconscious. The physicist will per analogy conclude that precisely this uncontrollable backlash of the observing subject onto the unconscious limits the objective character of its reality and at the same time provides it with some subjectivity. The development of microphysics has unmistakably, says Pauli, led to a remarkable convergence of its description of nature with that of the new psychology. And with the new psychology, he means Jung, of course. While the former, due to the fundamental situation known as complementarity, faces the impossibility to eliminate actions of observers by determinable corrections and must therefore in principle relinquish the objective registration of all physical phenomena. The latter could basically complement the merely subjective psycho psychology of consciousness by postulating the existence of an unconscious of largely objective reality. So you see how these different movements cross each other and lead into, you know, the, the, the objective, the allegedly objective physics into a subjective domain and the allegedly, alleged, allegedly, oh, I can't speak, uh, nature of, the, of psychology into an objective reality of the unconscious. A very fascinating idea. And it's very, you know, condensely and succinctly expressed by Pauli here. And we will see more about this in the following slides. 
Okay, um, here are some essential points, which I just repeat to make them a little bit more, a little bit better um, memorable. The Unus Mundus, the one world, is conceived as one ontic, ontologically existing, really psychophysically neutral reality without distinctions such as mind, matter, subject, object, self world, and uh, whatever you want. The mental and the physical mind and matter emerge as epistemic domains, dual aspects, due to a decomposition of the undivided unus mundus. And a decomposition I have noted this year in the mathematical sciences, decompositions are often um, fleshed out in terms of symmetry breakdowns. So whenever a symmetry is broken, you get a partition. Whenever a symmetry is restored, you make parts back into holes, right? That's what symmetries do in, in mathematics. Now, <clears throat> when we have this decomposition of a whole into parts, then generically, you always get correlations between the parts. So the psychophysical correlations, the correlations between the two aspects of the mental and the physical, reflect the lost holism, the broken symmetry of the unus mundus. And that this is, a, this is a fantastic benefit that you get from dual aspect monism, because no other, none of the other positions that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk give you the psychophysical correlations, so to speak, for free. You always have to introduce the correlations somehow ad hoc in all the other positions. Here you get them just for free. Of course, there's a price to be paid, and I will talk about that price later on. Now, these psychophysical correlations, and that is, a, that is an ongoing tenet of Jung and Pauli, are not due to a causal relation between the mental and the physical. So they are not causally substantiated. And of course, they are also not due to pure chance. So there is something, and this is a, this is a great and radical idea of Jung, they are substantiated by meaning. So meaning is the currency with which you can understand the correlations. I'm saying understand, not pay. So it's a, it, it's a wrong use of the notion of currency, probably. But this, like, the correlations, this is important to, to, um, to remember. The correlations, which are in science, usually understood by causal relations. And you have a cause and an effect, then they are related and give rise to correlations. Here, it's different. There is no cause between the mental and the physical. So the, the brain does not cause consciousness, and consciousness does not cause the brain. They are just correlated, but not due to a causal relation, but due to meaning. And this is typically expressed within the Pauli and Jung um, uh, mode of thinking. Symbolically, we come to that too. So this is an important point. The psychophysical correlations you get for free, not entirely, but for free. And the psychophysical correlations are not due to a cause between the mental and the physical going on there but they are uh, substantiated by meaning, by the meaning that a mental state can ascribe to a physical state or attribute to a physical state. Now, <clears throat> why was Pauli so interested in this kind of scheme? And this is one slide, which is only very briefly um, referring to something that um, we, we know very well in physics, but I want to uh, bring it here because uh, you can see there is a very nice analogy between an elementary phenomenon in quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement, and an analogous understanding of the mind-matter relation according to dual aspect monism. What you see here is, and the lower line, I have to, I can, see, you can, can, can you see the cursor here? Yeah, I think it's possible. You have, this is the characterization that uh, physicists, oh, get back with us. Physicists actually use to describe a an so-called entangled state. And an, an entangled state is a state of a physical system that cannot be described as a product of the two parts of this entangled state that can come out of it when you do a proper manipulation of it, right? So the entangled state is just the whole, which does not consist of parts. This is what the inequality sign shows you. Psi entangled, that's the state of the entangled system, is unequal to the product 
of the two states of the parts that can arise out of the entangled state when you manipulate it properly. Now the upper line here shows you Psi one and Psi two as disentangled states. So these are the separated states once you have done the manipulation and then you get two separate states out of the whole. These states, and this is, now this is in physics. Already in physics, you have a causal correlations between these states. So it's not only that, that uh, Pauli and Jung were talking about something and they posited that there is no causal relation. The causal relation already happens in certain um, instances within physics here in quantum physics. And of course in physics, you can test these, causal, these acausal correlations in a very precise way experimentally. And you, when you do experiments, you do statistics and you can find with very high precision uh, how these correlations behave as a, fun, as a function of certain parameters. So we have full control over these correlations in physics and we can demonstrate that they exist without any reasonable doubt. This is something that happened in the last 30, something like 30 years or 40 years. This is an, an enormous development in physics, which you can read about in a fascinating book by a uh, historian of science writer, Luisa Gilder. She wrote a very nice book published in 2008, I, I think, or seven. Uh, the Age of Entanglement is the title. And if you're interested in this, you should definitely read it. So what's the, what's the analogy with, with um, the mind matter problem? Here it is. So you see the general figure is the same. The, now the entangled state is replaced by the psychophysically neutral. Psi one is replaced by the mental. Psi two is replaced by the physical. And we have these relations. Uh, the arrows point in, in both directions, upward and downward. So you can disentangle and you can re-entangle. Now, the correlation between the mental and the physical, again, is a causal. I mentioned that before. But now, um, now we run into a problem when, you want, when we want to test these correlations, right? Because they are a causal, but since the mental and mental states are involved in these correlations, correlations are between the mental and the physical, it's not so easy to measure quantities that you can relate and put into, the, into your statistical machinery, right? So you, 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 you can't simply do statistics anymore and you have to find a way to, um, to locate, to identify and investigate the meaning that connects the mental and the physical. So you see the analogy is very nice, but as every, as every analogy, there are also differences. While you can test the correlation between disentangled physical states in terms of statistics, you cannot do that anymore for the mind-matter relation. And for the mind-matter relation, you need something that replaces the quantitative aspect of statistics by something qualitative. That is understood meaning. So you are in a mental state, look at something out there in the physical world, and then you see some, somehow there is a correlation why, how is the correlation substantiated? It's substantiated by the meaning that you attribute to the co-appearance of your state and the physical state. Now, the interesting thing here is, this is what you can really experience as, a, as, a, as the qualitative nature of your mental state, but many people think if, the, if it's just meaning that you attribute subjectively it is completely arbitrary. And this is not the case because the meaning and the correlation result from the psychophysically neutral, from the archetypal activity of the psychophysically neutral, which gives rise to both the mental and the physical event at the same time. So the archetypal activity itself frames the range of possible meanings that the subject can attribute. In that sense, it's, it's everything else than arbitrary because it is framed and limited, if you want, by the archetype that gives rise to the unfolded meaning that can be experienced between the mental and the physical. Isn't that a nice picture? I think it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, so that so far uh, for this physical analogy, and now I come to 
uh, look into these correlations in a little bit more detail. Um, we have two types of correlations, and that's something that follows out of the out of the uh, closer investigations of what Pauli and Jung were discussing uh, in that respect. We have two types. One of them are structural and persistent, and the other one, the other type is induced and occasional. I think this is easy to understand. The structural and persistent psychophysical correlations are something that happens to us in our lives every day, every hour, every second. Uh, when we are under stress, our blood pressure rises, and this is very stable. Um, we have, we know, neural correlates of consciousness, which are pretty stable as well. When you remove Broca's area from a subject, from an individual, then uh, this individual will have problems to speak. And this is universal, it's really stable, structural and persistent. The induced and occasional psychophysical correlations are tending more to uh, what Jung called synchronicities, right? They don't happen whenever this is the case or that is the case, they are happening spontaneously, right? And therefore they are not controllable. This is important for this full picture here. Um, this is just, Essentially, what I said already, the, the persistent structural correlations are robustly reproducible, while the induced correlations are somehow evasive. Sometimes they happen, sometimes not. And they are not reproducible in the sense of what scientific methodology would require in order to count them as real. So we are, again, we are moving out of the domain of established scientific methodology here. Why? Very simply, because the mental becomes included. It's not only the physical anymore. Correlations are correlations between the mental and the physical. So in the sense that the structural correlations are robust and the induced correlations are not, we can come up uh, with a picture in which the structural psychophysical correlations provide a baseline, that's a stable baseline. And, um, from this baseline, induced psychophysical correlations, the spontaneous one, ones deviate. Now, of course, then once you have this picture, then there are um, positive, positive and negative deviations from the baseline possible. We call the positive deviations excess correlations or experiences of coincidence. And the negative deviations we call deficit correlations. So these would be experiences of dissociation. In the excess case, we have more correlations than we usually experience. And in the deficit uh, situation, we experience less correlations than usually. So some of the correlations are interrupted somehow or blocked. And both of these <clears throat> um, deviating correlations are experienced as meaningful just because they deviate from the baseline. The, the, the correlations at the baseline that we, that we, you know, that go on all the time, they are not explicitly uh, experienced as something. Nobody has ever experienced um, a, a neural correlate of consciousness, something like that. This is, these are just correlations that are baseline correlations. Now, um, from this whole picture, we can, can come up with, a, with an interesting taxonomy of exceptional experiences. So these would be the experiences above and below the baseline. We have this fourfold, um, this fourfold taxonomy, and let me just go through the four, the four uh, phenomena classes that are uh, listed here. So we have um, connected by the horizontal line, we have internal and external phenomena. Internal phenomena are simply deviations within the self bubble of the subject. So like this would be something like hearing voices that have no external origin. External phenomena would be deviations in the broad model of the subject. And here we would have something like um, a phenomena which, which you know, seemingly, apparently, have no real cause, like flying knives or you know, moving um, tables or something. Um, often, often uh, uh, um, denoted as poltergeist phenomena, which, which people report. 
So I have to say at this point that we are not looking at the physical veridicality of these phenomena in, this, in these studies. We are looking at the phenomenology that the subjects describe to us. So it's a, this is really a phenomenological undertaking. It's not something where we try to you know, make sure that something really happened in the physical world. Uh, and we think this would be the wrong way to look at these phenomena. Now connected by the vertical um, line, we have coincidence phenomena and dissociation phenomena. These are exactly the, the two classes which I uh, showed you already on the last slide. The coincidence phenomena are the phenomena that relate to excess correlations. So ordinarily disconnected elements of self-model and world model for the metal and the material become connected and Opposite to that, the dissociation phenomena deal with, with the disconnection of ordinarily connected elements of self model and work model. So, dissociation phenomena typically, uh, a very well known example are out of body experiences where your mental state does, not, does no longer really show this intimate connection to your bodily state that we have in our ordinary lives. So, there's a disconnection. Of, an, of a relation between mental and physical, between mental state and physical state, uh, which are ordinarily connected by the relation of what philosophers now call mindness. This is my body. I feel it's my body. This, this relation is really it gets lost in, in out of body experiences. Coincidence phenomena, on the other hand, are just the opposite. Uh, you experience connections in the, between your mental state and the physical world, which you usually do not experience. And this is mainly what, what synchronicities are about. Right? You experience something in the outside world, and you have been thinking about something in your mental state, which all of a sudden gets connected to this happening in the outside world, out of nothing. And Jung has described many phenomena like this, and I don't, I don't add other examples here. I think every single one of you in the audience um, know what I'm talking about. So this is the taxonomy that we can really evolve out of the party Jung conjecture. So this is a theoretical prediction that we can make. And of course, whenever you make a theoretical prediction, then what you want to do in the next step is uh, try to find out whether this can be empirically grounded, right? No, this is the rest of my talk. Um, um, we have at the Institute of Frontier Areas of Psychology at Freiburg, we have now, um, where I was until 2007, as Donald said in the, in the introduction, we have now more than 2,300 reports of exceptional experiences by people who are coming to the, um, to the counseling department at this institute because they don't understand these experiences, they are threatened by them. Some of them just like to understand them because they were so enriching for their lives. There are many different motives, but one, one, one through going motive is that most of these people had been in psychiatric treatment or they had, had been visiting psychoanalysts or psychotherapists and didn't find answers to their questions. So there are all, uh, how do we call these? Um, the non-diagnosed subsample. They are non -di they are not di they, they, they get out of the practice without a diagnosis. The DSM or ICD in Europe uh, has all these lists where you have where you have to fulfill a certain amount of minimal, minimal points, and when you get when you don't get to that level, you don't get a diagnosis, and then of course you don't get treatment. Right. So these people come to the to this institute and and ask for advice. This is a, so that, that's, the, that's the reason why we get these, this huge number of reports, which now are very carefully documented. There are questionnaires which, which you can run with these people. And so there is really a, a huge body of empirical material that we now can test or can put into uh, the usual torture instruments that statistics provides. Not statistics as in the sense of quantum mechanics, which I mentioned before, but statistics in the sense of relating these experiences to the taxonomy, right? 
I also should mention uh, two other researchers who are very active in this field now. This is Tanya Luhrmann at Stanford who just published a, a cross-cultural investigation of, of exceptional experiences in, um, in the proceedings of the National Academy. Very recent work, 2021. And uh, also Anne Taves in Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, who is um, more looking toward the meaning aspect of these ex exceptional experiences from a cognitive science theoretical point of view. Very interesting work and very worthwhile to look into also for, for Jungian psychology, I think. Now, we, well, I said that before, we look, we're looking at the phenomenology of these experiences and uh, do all, all this kind of stuff, factor analysis, cluster analysis, um, spectral analysis. And um, just in order to check whether the experiences really match the theoretical taxonomy, right? And what we find is there's that all these different kinds of analyses actually give rise to these to the four pattern taxonomy that I presented to you in the last slide. Fantastic. Distribution over different patterns is comparable for different subsamples. And uh, we also actually, in combination with a study, um, no, I should say that differently. A study in combination with the um, psychiatric clinic in Zurich, formerly known as the Burkhölzli, and everybody knows what, it, what the Burkhölzli is. Um, so we could also establish psychophysical studies, laboratory studies, to provide even more selective information, for instance, allowing the identification of individuals with coincidence dispositions against other dispositions, against dissociation, against internal, against external. Very in interesting work. Um, here is a summary of all these empirical um, studies for different subsamples within these 2,300 cases. And I, this, I have to explain a little bit about this slide here. Um, we have these concentric circles which start with zero in the middle and then the next circle is uh, 0.5, then there's one, then there's 1.5, then there's two. Uh, these numbers are um, coding the frequency of these exceptional experiences for different people, right? So one me, zero means they experience never, they, the experience of exceptional experience, the experience of exceptional experiences happens never. Uh, one means sometimes, two means often, three would mean frequent, and four would mean almost always. So it's obvious that we have, uh, we, plot, we plot the averages here so we don't get far out because this will be, will be um, counteracted by other um, subjects that experience nothing. But you see that at least, you know, some of these subsamples, which I'm going to discuss in a second, reach pretty much out into almost level two at the upper case, right? So the, um, the cross, the vertical and horizontal line mean the same as in the taxonomy picture. We have internal phenomena on the left, external phenomena on the right, coincidence um, above and dissociation below. And now we have six subsamples that you see um, plotted here with different symbols. So this through going line, the, uh, the uninterrupted line, the solid line that is, um, let's see, that would be this one, going down here, going over here, and in here, and back to this. This characterizes uh, the subjects that are seeking advice at the Freiburg Institute, right? So they have, they, they are in a kind of medium range in terms of frequency. Now, if you look at the, at this, at this code here, this is Swiss general population. So people who are not selected by, you know, having experiences or not, they are just selected as a random sample within general population in Switzerland. You see this um, uh, code, where is it? It's here, right? You see it here, going over here and back here. And you see that the frequency in this subsample is 
significant, significantly smaller than in the IGPP sample, as expected, because the IGPP sample has people who are already looking for advice, right? Now, if you take these figures here, which have the highest frequencies, uh, or this one, the, the dotted line, which goes here, also pretty high frequency. These are the, let me see, these are the, okay, this one, this dashed line here is coded NDE. These are people which have, which had uh, near-death experiences in their past. And this other line, the dotted line, these are MED, these are people with, um, these are practicing meditators. So these two subsamples show the highest frequencies of exceptional experiences um, in, in all the four classes, essentially, right? Which is also somehow to be expected, but of course we don't have a detailed explanation so far. There's a lot of work for the future um, included in this kind of slide here. And of course, we also, we're not only interested in the frequency, we're also interested in the intensity of the experiences. And this is also something that we, we have, we have um, empirical material for, but it's not um, finally evaluated yet. There's much to come out of this, but the, the, the basic message is that we really have reason to believe that all this empirical material that I was describing really matches the theoretical prediction by the Pauli Jung conjecture fascinatingly well. Now I go over this. Now the summary uh, you see here, the Pauli Jung conjecture of dual aspect monism with mind and matter as epistemic dual aspects of an underlying ontic undivided psychophysical neutral reality. Uh, this conjecture has a lot of empirical support already now um, in terms of its taxonomy of exceptional experiences. Psychophysically neutral archetypal patterns are not only accessible by their manifestations, but they may become experienced directly. That's a, a topic that I did not explicitly discuss here. Um, Pauli and Jung were originally very convinced that the psychophysically neutral domain is not accessible itself, only through its manifestations in the physical and the mental. And when Jung finally published his um, Mysterium Conjunctionis, actually Jung made the step beyond this belief. When he said, when he talked about the, the um, three types of conjunctio at the end of the book, and he really um, says something that can be interpreted very much like what I say here. There, there are ways, there are ways to experience conjunctios where the psychophysically neutral really can become an imminent experience, not only through the aspects, but directly. So that would that would violate the the neo-Kantian belief that anything like psychophysically neutral is is and remains transcendent forever. So Jung did not believe that any longer at the end of his life. So this is something I did not talk about very much in detail, but um, uh, this is something that also is discussed in detail in the book that, that Dean and I actually published. We, in that book, we make a dis distinction between meaning as reference and meaning as sense, right? Meaning as reference is, essentially uh, the notion of aboutness. If something is about something else, then you can say the meaning of that which is about something is that which it is about, right? Sense is different. For, uh, the meaning uh, um, understood as sense, we attribute to the relation of the mental and the physical to the psychophysically neutral, to the archetypal. And that makes a lot of sense because this covers the aspect of symbolic sense, really. Meaning as reference is, is a kind of surface relation between the mental and the physical. But when you want to look at where this meaning, meaning comes from, it has a symbolic origin, and that is better described uh, in, in certain ways that we discuss in the book by the notion of sense, actually. Okay, so this was the summary, and here are two books which you might want to consult if you are interested in more details. 
Uh, the left one is the one that Donald already referred to, the Pauli-Hun conjecture and its impact today, including also papers by Beverly uh, Zabriski, by Joe Cambray, by George Hoganson, by Christopher Fuchs, and many other interesting people. On the right-hand side, you see the cover of the book that just appeared by myself, together with Dean Rickles, who you hear next. Uh, the title is Dual Aspect Monism and the Deep Structure of Meaning. And in this title, you see already an indication of a distinction between something that's going on at the surface, meaning as reference, and um, the, deep, the actual deep structure would really be the relation of experienced meaning to its symbolic origin. So I think I took maybe three minutes more than I have, should have, but thank you very much. And I'm uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Uh, I don't know if I'm on screen now, but uh, I'll remind folks that uh, if you have questions for Harold, uh, please tap them into the chat and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read them out to everybody and we'll uh, see what we can drum up. Could I ask a question? Of course, uh, Beverly, since you're right here. Hi. Um, so Harold, could you say more about the, in, in those three conjunctions that Yuk talks about in Mysterium, do you think of the first two as about imminence? And then the third one, which is the mysterious conjunction between an individual who's able to participate and relate to the world, the inner world and the outer world as the more transcendent? I think the second one is more this, um, oh, let me put, let me start with the first one. The first one is the Unio Mentalis. Right. The Unio Mentalis connects um, the mental ego with the unconscious, mm -hmm. right? So that already has, a, has a, an aspect of a deep relation to the symbolic, right? Then Jung's second conjuncto is essentially synchronicity. It's the, the connection between the, the mental world of an individual with the physical world outside. And the third one, that, that's really, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's imminent full scope uh -huh. because that connects the first and the second. And what, what Jung actually, what we are saying in the book is actually what Jung misses out is the fourth conjunction. Uh -huh. Because Jung, and this is understandable because Jung is a, is a psychologist, Pauli in several um, passages in the, in, the, uh, in the correspondence, he makes always clear and he tries to convince you that whenever you have an unio mentalis between um, the mental world and the archetypes, the archetypal world, then you must also have a, a relation between the physical world and the archetypal world. Jung never discusses that. But Pauli always tries to convince him Whenever you have this, you must also have this. And Jung's uh, also the, the conjunct in the Mysterium conjunction is this does not play a role. Of course, understandable because Jung is not a physicist. He is not so much interested in the physical world. And Pauli is a physicist, so this is the first thing that he that he that he recognizes. And we have a chapter actually in the book where we discuss exactly this point. And and you don't think on the personal realm that instinct and archetypal image in some way take care of that in terms of personal experience. You could say that the third conjunctio actually presupposes what we would call the fourth one. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, but it's, but Jung is very elaborate about the other three and doesn't say anything about the fourth, so that's interesting, I think. <laughs> but it's actually, you're right. It, it is from a systematic point of view, it is included, mm -hmm. must be. Thank you, Beverly. Uh... Have we got any other questions or comments from the audience? Uh, uh, we've got a question here from Farzad Mahushin. Okay. Greetings, Farzad. 
haven't seen you in a while. Uh, regarding Harold's point about the correlation between mental and physical, you could run statistics on the language the subject uses to communicate their synchronistic experience, right? Also, language is the mechanism that facilitates the backlash or feedback from conscious to collective unconscious. Language. That's an earful there. Okay. You might want to take the question uh, in two parts. Uh, could, could one run statistics on the language the right. subject used to communicate their synchronistic experience? I would say you're welcome to try Farsad. I, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is something, I mean, applying statistics to synchronistic experiences is something that many people have tried. Um, uh, I would say, this is my assessment. I, I probably don't know all the studies, but uh, my assessment is without success. And even in Jung's own synchronicity article, he looked for couples in terms of astrological configurations. I mean, Pauli tried hard over months to convince Jung to leave that out of his article because he thought it's nonsense. It doesn't give any really statistical significance. And so I'm skeptical about that. The second point is about uh, language itself as something that can be related to archetypal activity, if I understood that correctly, right? Mm -hmm. This is a point that we address in the book, actually, Dean and I, uh, and is it, um, we have a chapter, we have a chapter in the book on meaning, which goes through eight different um, um, understandings of meaning in the recent history of philosophy beginning with Dorentano and Frege, and ending with uh, Eugene Gendlin and Marcus Gabriel. And in the middle, there is Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein says something exactly, uh, which resonates very much to um, Farsad, what you said. Um, Wittgenstein said, before we actually ascribe, or before we select a certain notion for something that we want to describe, there is much, and now I quote, stage setting going on, much stage setting going on before we do the, the conscious work. That's original um, words by Wittgenstein. And you can easily interpret that as, I mean, Wittgenstein did not talk about archetypal talents in this, but you can easily interpret it in that way. And um, so we have um, one section on it over three or four pages. But I think this would be worthwhile to be studied in much more detail. So the answer is, short answer is yes. Yes. We do have time for more questions and comments. I have another comment. And I'm sure, and I'd like to hear what Morgan thinks about this too. I think some of the relation to the physical world, Jung addresses when he writes, the clinical papers like psychology of the transference, where he talks about all of the um, sort of physiological chemical transmissions that go on between the analyst and mm -hmm. the analyzant. And so in that way, the physiological and, and the material is very active and alive, but I'd be interested in Morgan's comment about that too. Yeah, I would have a tendency to say that this is maybe closer to the to the baseline correlations mm -hmm. than to exceptional experiences, really, because we, I mean, we do not experience this correlation where when serotonin is, you know, I don't know what, and so on. And we just experience the effect of it mm -hmm. mentally. But there is, um, I think we talked about that before. There is now. Um, Going, there's now very interesting research going on um, on correlations between the action of anesthetics. No, not anesthetics, I'm Psych sorry. No. Psycho psychoactive drugs. And on the one side, this is physics, or, or I mean, this is the physical world at least, and experiences that are correlated with them. I'm not saying released by them because this would sound too causal, right? So it's not causal. It's correlated. And that's, that's a recent um, development in the study of, in psychopharmacological studies, which 
I mean, I'm coming just from the from, from the Tucson conference, and there was there were two big plenary sessions about this psychedelics, psychedelics, psychedelics. and their relation to to exceptional experiences. George Mashur, uh, Robin Card Harris, and, and others, Catherine Preller and Zurich are names that are associated with them. Mm -hmm. But Morgan, maybe you have to say more about that. Hi, yes, trying to unmute myself here. Um, well, such a rich presentation as usual. And, you know, I wanted to, I mean, of course, in the afternoon, we'll get into what this looks like in the therapeutic model. So it's, which is a much more, in a sense, mundane or everyday model. Um, but, you know, Jung does say that the psyche itself is an intervention in the baseline function of the natural order. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which, uh, you know, depending on one's uh, sensitivity, I think, that the deviations can be experienced in a more and more minute way. Um, and speaking of language, back to sort of Farzad's, uh, Farzad's point or question is, you know, Jung established some link between experiences of what he called the self, which is some kind of totality, and historical experiences of God by comparing language. Mm -hmm. And that was one of his main points that of course upset everyone, the scientists and the theologians that, you know, if you look at it at the level of expression through language, which has some relation to experience, those descriptions are the same, which I think brings in a historical factor to this whole, uh, this whole enterprise. Yeah, I would agree very much, but I would still say, don't try statistics on this. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, because it's it's really we're talking uh, we're talking about really qualitative um, resonances, right? Something like that. Yeah. But how, how would you how would you put qualitative experiences into statistics? It's very it's very difficult. Okay. Okay, we've got a couple more uh, questions and comments here. Uh, first of all, uh, Farzad says, uh, great, thanks uh, for that encouragement. He's going to be doing some digital humanities digging um, into the alchemical text to find some noisy signal. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, okay. Uh, Milton Maltz uh, asks, uh, the question is, if this model is a disentanglement, can it be started by an intention of the ego, that is the conscious domain, that through volition can cause one cause correlations? Uh, there have been quite a number of studies which have tried to do that in the lab. And this is usually um, covered by the notion of psychokinesis studies. There are some people in Princeton who have been doing this and um, actually, when I was in Freiburg, we, we started off our activity there, really actually checking uh, whether these experiments hold water and, and the meta-analyses which are connected to these experiments, whether they hold water. So um, our you know, results, we, I hired a first-rate statist statistician really to do these studies and um, the results were disappointing. All these publications that come up, come up with, you know, psychokinesis working with, I don't know, significance of P equals something. Uh, they, um, when you do the analysis, or that when you check the design of the experiment in detail, um, any, anything that we tried out, nothing was left. And of course, then at some point, we, we didn't continue that kind of debunking thing because it's, it's hugely, um, it's very, it's very difficult to go into all these details. It takes a lot of time and energy. And um, so since we were not convinced about some of the samples that we really studied, we went on and, and um, tried out our own ideas, which I think are much more successful, much more, more significant as I, as I described in this talk. Okay. Uh, Can I put in something on that? Is that okay? Sure, Morgan. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, uh, Harold, of your chart 
of the different um, of how the exceptional experiences arise in different groups and interesting, as you pointed out, that the near-death experience group and mm -hmm. the meditator group has much bigger incidence. Mm -hmm. I think that connects to the idea that one can, um, in a sense, set the table and one can, you know, invite those experiences and one can yeah. be tuned, which yes. is very different than causing them. Exactly. I agree. Um, what we can try is, and that's what meditative practices, for instance, do is provide something like, they call it necessary conditions for something to happen. But these conditions are never sufficient that it really happens. In a laboratory study, you really want to control everything so that it has to happen. Uh, if you only have necessary conditions, you don't do that. You know, you can you can you can provide you can provide incentives for the experience to happen, but if it happens or not, is left to it. So they happen. That's, a, that's an essential difference between what we are studying. We are studying spontaneous experiences as opposed to laboratory controlled experiences, right? So I, this is essentially, this is really a good point that you make, Martin. Okay, um, we have a question about, uh, can you describe the difference between synchronicity and the intuitive experience, a subjective spontaneous anticipation of an event? Do they have something in common in their spontaneous presentation? This, say that again, the, the, so that would be about precognition, something like that? The, the difference between uh, synchronicity and the intuitive experience. Oh. That is in a, a spontaneous, spo a subjective, spontaneous anticipation of an event. Anticipation of a future event. Right, yeah. So I think in a broader sense of precognition, that's, that's what people call this, is, is actually a part of synchronistic event. Um, there is something behind this. There's, there's some discussion going on between Pauli and Jung about the notion of synchronicity. Um, Jung originally thought that synchronistic events have to happen at some kind of same in the same times, you know, simultaneously. And actually, I mentioned the, the correspondence between Pauli and Jung before the synchronicity article was published. And actually, Pauli could convince Jung that this is the wrong conception. And uh, synchronistic events can extend over time. Then you have the anticipation at some point, and maybe the next day, the physical event. Mm -hmm. It still would be a synchronistic event, even in Jung's sense, right? So that's the answer to that question. Yes, OK, yeah, thanks. That's from uh, Arminia Scarcella. Uh, Margaret Klenk, uh, thanks you for the presentation. She says, I'm struck by how so much of current psychology, especially current trauma theory, disregards the four aspects of your chart and only works from the fourth, the dissociative phenomenon. Yes, that's interesting. Which means there can be no meaning in trauma. Your work helps us resist the tide of current trauma theory to help our analysis. Do you have any work with trauma in your studies? We, we don't so far, <clears throat> but I, I think one of the reasons why only dissociation is considered, that's due to the heurist, completely heuristic uh, setup of the DSM and the ICD. They have no theoretical model really from which they build up their, all their characteristics and the dimension of whatever they treat. Um, I think a theoretical approach like, like the one that, that uh, we have worked out, but maybe others too, might be much more helpful to get a fuller picture, which covers not only dissociation experiences, but also coincidence experiences, for instance. And I can imagine that coincidence experiences don't feature in the DSM because they are attributed to Jung. Jung is miscredited in academic psychology, and so goes the story. And this is completely wrong. So. I think it also has something to do with a very different sense of time because there's the emotional psychic time, which is really much more the felt experience or the, the new understanding. And as opposed to the time of something specific happening to one that then 
determines all many future events. So there's something about qualitative time and quantitative time here. It's yeah, very that's, different. That's possible. But then I would assume that uh, people who set up the DSM, uh, they, are, they are just using physical time. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It yeah. happened at four months and that's it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I think we can take a couple. I have one other comment on that which is back to that chart on the near-death experience, I think you could call that a trauma. And that leads to actually greater possibility, in, at least in terms of your study, of these kinds of exceptional experiences. And you know, for Jung, one of the essential qualities of the total psyche is its dissociability, which leads to other, you know, a more adaptive reassociation. Mm -hmm. right? That's his essentially spagyric model. Mm. Okay, we, I think we can take a couple more questions and then maybe take a brief break before 11 o'clock. Uh, Roseanne Gold asks, what would be the resonance or correlation? What would resonance or correlation be without actual language, as meaning words, but with images or drawings? Um, I, I would say, Correlations can be phrased in different ways. Uh, some people will report them in terms of words and sentences. Uh, if others would show them in terms of images, I, I don't have any problem with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's another way to express, sure. right? Yeah, to express oneself. Okay, and uh, here's a, a common question from Tamar Eliam. Uh, we have made a lot of advances in the artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence, which is the next frontier of statistics, such as natural language processing. The fact that we failed with statistics before does not mean we won't succeed with AI in the future, which is a very powerful technique, albeit requiring interdisciplinary studies. Starting with language, words, occurrences, etc., could be a good step. I think that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, it could be. My comment is that um, somehow uh, not so optimistic on AI. My comment would be that AI solves about 50% of the problems that it has created. <laughs> But you know, we don't know what happens in the future. So maybe AI will, will open up some new um, interesting domains of, of research and investigations, maybe leading to results. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't anticipate that from here. Okay, well, at the moment, that's all we've got. And maybe this is a good time to take a break about 10 minutes until uh, 11 a.m. at which point we'll begin with Dean Rickles uh, if I'm so, still awake at that point. If you're still awake. If you can tell us your dreams, perhaps, Dean. Yeah, it's a good idea. An, it will be an exceptional experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>